Welcome to Salon Talks. Today I'm joined by Cheryl Strayed. Cheryl's memoir, Wild, was adapted into a movie starring Reese Witherspoon. She's also the author of Torch and Tiny Beautiful Things. And today she's here to talk about the TV adaptation of Tiny Beautiful Things. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, Olivia. It's great to be here with you. Yeah, thanks for being here. So I want to start by talking about the show. Um, you've been the voice behind Dear Sugar, the Dear Sugar advice column for over 10 years now. In 2012, you released a collection of some of your best nuggets of wisdom, the most beautiful letters, and your best pieces of advice um, into a collection called Tiny Beautiful Things. How did you turn these separate entries into a narrative story for the show? Well, that was an undertaking, let me tell you, because of course, in one way, I was sure that this book could be adapted for TV because it is so full of stories. Not only do I tell stories about my own life in the course of giving advice to people, but really every letter that's written to me is a story, right? People present their struggles and their secrets and their sorrows and their conundrums and all of that stuff in the book. So innately, I knew anything rich with story is great fodder for television. And yet when it came to figuring out how to make it into television, it took some doing. And really Liz Tigelar, the creator and showrunner, it, she's just such a wonderful human and also really smart and amazing writer. And so she and I just began having conversations and really landed on this idea of, you know, the story being very much about this woman at the center of the column, Sugar herself. Um, and I think Liz was really sparked by this notion that I tell stories from my own life by way of giving advice, which what I always hope conveys is this truth that like, okay, listen, I'm not the one who knows, you know, I'm not like the guru who's going to tell you all the wise things and tell you how to live and give you instructions. What I'm going to do is say, I am right down in there with you. I'm also grappling. I'm also struggling. I also don't always know. And I, I always think of myself as almost like ex trying to expand the questions that were asked of me, trying to help you know, through through sentences and stories, illuminate um, the situation in a way that allows the letter writer and everyone reading it to see the situation differently. And so, you know, we began from that premise, like, what if we have a woman who's, who isn't a guru, who's just like an ordinary woman who, in some ways has a messed up life and has made some mistakes and in other ways has wisdom and experience to share. Um, and who is a writer whose calling is to be a writer and to share her wisdom you know, through the written word. So we began with that. We began with that character of Claire played by Catherine Hahn, who is me in that she and I have, you know, a lot of the same formative, formative experiences. And yet in her adult life, she took a very different path than me. So she's very much a fictional character as well. Yeah, yeah that's actually what I wanted to ask you about. I know that you have some similarities and yet some important differences. What was it like yeah. to develop a character who is kind of you, but not quite? Well, what's cool is, so developing the character of Claire was actually developing kind of two characters. So we have the, the adult Claire, who's Catherine Hahn, who's married and has a teenager and a job and always wanted to be a writer and actually had some early promise as a writer, published a bit in her 20s, but then never kind of followed through on it because life took over. And then we have the younger version of Claire, um, played by Sarah Pigeon. And Sarah Pigeon really enacts in her scenes, you know, Claire in her teens and, and, and early 20s. And those scenes, Olivia, are like really, you know, my story. Those scenes are, are you know, the, many of the stories that you see that I that I tell in Tiny Beautiful Things. Um, I, I said to, to Liz and the writers in the room, like it, it, it was really important to me that those formative experiences I had in my youth um, and childhood were the things that in so many ways inform Claire, Catherine's character. Um, I lost my mom to cancer very suddenly when she was 45. I grew up poor and working class in a rural environment. I have a father who was abusive and from whom I've been estranged for years. I got married in my 20s, insanely young. I actually, mm, I was 19 when I got married, which just makes me think like, what was I thinking? Um, and divorced you know, by the time I was 25. So those things are all in, you know, behind Catherine, Catherine's Claire in the form of Sarah Pigeon. So there's the autobiography. And then, and then, 
you know, Claire took a different path than me. And so it's both deep, deep, you know, autobiography and deep fiction. And it must have been such a fun thought experiment for you to see. I know um, the showrunner talked about it's it's you if you hadn't hiked the Pacific Coast Trail. Yeah. But so we meet Claire at a really difficult time in her life. Her relationship with her husband is in trouble. Her teenage daughter hates her guts. And she's not doing the thing that she loves to do, which is writing. And she's trying so hard. She's so well-intentioned. But life is a mess. What do you think that says about Claire and then the rest of us? Well, I think I think what it says about Claire is welcome to being 49, right? <laughs> or being middle-aged. You know, one of the 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 things that I always have tried to write about in, in, in as sugar, you see it everywhere in tiny beautiful things, is I'm always saying, like our work here is not to be perfect. Our work here is to evolve. And not just once, you know. I think that so many of us, maybe because it gives us a sense of like safety or false security, um, we think, okay, in your 20s, that's the decade where you're like, what am, who am I? And should I go here or there? Should I be in this relationship or that? Or should, which path should I take? There's a sense that in your 20s, you do a lot of stuff, get lost, go down some wrong paths, but eventually you find your path, right? And And then you're set for life. And of course, that's not true. And so I love this opportunity uh, in this show that we get to say, okay, she did choose her path in her 20s and she followed it and it worked out pretty well. And now look, she's at this other moment in her life where it's time for her to evolve again. Her, her teenage daughter, who, as you say, hates her, like every teenage daughter on the planet. <laughs> I mean, they having my own 17-year-old teenage daughter, I can tell you, they absolutely love you too. They just, sometimes it's buried... Um, you know, under like, I mean, all of that, the love and the turmoil that that separating from the parents stuff, all of that is so natural and normal. There's so much love between them, but there is that conflict. And as we see that, what, what Claire is real, realizing is, you know, her life has to, to evolve and change in this next chapter as her daughter's going to be leaving home soon. And, and a lot of people have a, you know, they re-examine their lives during that point. And so it was really a pleasure to get to tell a story about a woman who is my contemporary. I'm, I'm 54 and, you know, going through so many of the same things that Claire is going through on the screen to really tell a complicated story that, that was about all the beautiful mess of life. Yeah, and actually one thing I was thinking about is in the introduction to Tiny Beautiful Things, Steve Allman writes that something like one reads sugar with tears in their eyes. And I will tell you, one watches sugar with tears in their eyes as well. I cried almost every episode. Why do you think your work is so emotional? Oh, well, I love to make people cry. So thank you, Olivia. <laughs> it's really one of my favorite things. I think I think that it's emotional. And I want to say too about that crying. I'm going to guess that sometimes you cried because something was sad, but a lot of times you cried because something was beautiful, you know? And I think that that's what I most strive to do. Um, the truth is beautiful. The complicated, contradictory, raw, real truth is you know, emotional and it makes us, it opens our hearts, you know? And I think that when we see people, you know, being vulnerable or living vulnerably or, or speaking vulnerably, it, something inside of us opens up. And I think that that's really the mission of art. Um, it is to tell us um, who we, who we are as humans and not just who we are, but who are we really? That is, that is everything I always wanted to do. And I love that in this show, I think it asks those same questions. Yeah, definitely. I would say that your work, even when it's dealing with the saddest parts and like just the most heartbreaking stories, it makes us feel human and more connected. Um, is that also something you strive to do? That's what I do. That's what I strive to do. I mean, I would say like my really, what do I want to do with my writing? I want to make people feel less alone. And, and because I know that, that literature and television and film, all, all art forms really have the power to do that. That's why I love art of all forms because I say, oh yes, this, this is what it does feel like to grieve or this is what it does feel like to love or this is what it feels like to be jealous or to have a sense of longing. All of those, those emotions that we experience in a really particular individual way are actually universal experiences. And so when you do write a show or a book, 
that other people say, oh yes, me too. That, that is, I mean, that's my whole intention and dream. Yeah, actually. And that's one of the essays I remember most from Tiny Beautiful Things is when you were like dealing head on with jealousy. It didn't make it into the show, but talking about if, you know, a partner is sharing their previous experiences and like why we shouldn't run from that, even though it, it makes us uncomfortable. Yeah. And that was actually a, an experience I had watching the show. Like one of the surprising things I loved about it was having all of your words come rushing back to me. I was like finishing Catherine's Han sentences as she was reading the letters aloud. Oh. But this book is 10 years old. Um, what is your relationship to the work that you created that long ago? How have these essays changed for you? That's such a great question. So, you know, um, it, you're right. It's t It was published first um, almost now, almost 11 years ago. And when I, so it's been reissued. There's a 10th anniversary edition that's out with a new introduction and a new, and some new columns in it as well. And so when I was putting together, like add, choosing the new columns to add, I went back and read the book for the first time, honestly, in probably a decade. And what I was struck by was, again, you know, really, we all have the same problems um, throughout all time. <laughs> You know, I mean, that, that's what's so fascinating to me. Like somebody could have written to me, you know, 12 years ago about infidelity and my, you know, th th that problem hasn't changed. You know, the truth, the core truth about how we address any one of these struggles has remained the same. So I was amazed that like, you know, always as a writer, you could go back and say, well, I would have tweaked that sentence, but I never would have changed the core advice in any of the columns, which who was a relief to me. <laughs> I mean, because I would, I would hate to be like, whoops, I shouldn't have said that, you know? And so it, it really was a wonderful experience for me to say, okay, that, that to say that this advice is still relevant now. Yeah. That was something I wondered about is if you had things you wanted to add or things you, cause I know as a writer, I have stuff I want to change all the time. So that's got to feel like yeah. a huge success. Um, <laughs> the show makes a point that like being broken is a beautiful place to start. But I also think that when we think about seeking advice, we want to go to the experts, whatever that means. Um, what do you want people to take away from watching Claire's story? Well, I think I first want to say about that expert thing is, you know, I think that wisdom comes from so many different sources and that that's where we should seek advice from all of the sources, from the therapist and the quote unquote experts who have been trained in, in psychology and, and emotional well-being, right? But we all know too, that sometimes there's nothing like a conversation with a friend who says, I know you and I love you and I see you and this is this is what I think you should do or a beloved family member or a, or somebody sometimes just a stranger actually like having an interaction with you that you that that blows you away because you're awakened to something or an advice columnist so you write to and say here's what I can't say to anyone else and I'm going to tell you because it's anonymous and you can answer me you know and um, I, I think that all of those sources are the ways that we that we seek wisdom and, and learn how to thrive. And what I want, your question was, what do I want people to feel? Is that what you, what was that? So, yeah, or what do, what do you want them to take away from watching Claire's story where she's maybe not in a place to start giving right. advice or where people would generally say she should start giving advice? Exactly. And right. And that's, and that's, and, and that's totally connected to what I was just saying is that you don't have to be an expert to contribute. You don't have to be, um, you know, an expert to say, I have something to say that, that might be of use. If you speak from your truest voice, by which I mean the one, the, the deepest one, the most vulnerable one, the one that's willing to risk vulnerability, um, say the scary thing, that you feel or that you know, if you speak from that voice almost always, it's going to ring a bell in the hearts of other people because they will say, I recognize you. I know what you're saying. I believe you because I feel it too. And I hope that people um, take that from the show. You know, broken is a beautiful place to begin. And what I wanna say is most of us are broken. Most of us are. I mean, I don't know a perfect person. And what I love about 
myself and so many others are, are really the, the the ways that we can both be perfect and imperfect at the same time. That, you know, we can have messy lives that are falling apart in some ways um, and also have so much courage and strength and wisdom. And that we all have something to offer wherever we are on that spectrum. Yeah, and it's also interesting to see how much, you know, Claire gets out of being sugar and presumably how much you got out in those got out of being sugar in those early days. Um, it, it says that this is what Claire needed. Is that how it was for you? For sure. You know, I I wouldn't say that when I began writing the column, I felt like my life is falling apart. You know, I, I don't share that aspect with with this character. But I will say there is no question whatsoever that writing the Dear Sugar column has has made me a better person because I have been forced to reflect on so many people's problems now. Every I still am once a month, I write another Dear Sugar column and I'm still constantly thinking like, well, how can I help this person who's asking a question about, you know, fill in the blank? I have to search my own soul to answer it. I have to examine my own life. And a question I often ask myself when I when I give people advice, I think like, am I am I doing that? Like, am I taking my own advice? And I can tell you this: um, I I would be a better person if I did. <laughs> but you know, I do. It it makes me. I mean, it forces me to be more contemplative about my own life as well as the lives of others. Yeah, and I just want to ask you one last question before you go. So. First and foremost, obviously you're a writer, you were a published writer before Dear Sugar, um, but now you're also a podcaster and a producer. Um, you made this show with Reese Witherspoon's production company, Hello Sunshine, which is all about telling women's stories. How has your career changed over the years and what does success mean to you now? Ooh. Success um, has, the, the meaning of success has remained unchanged for me for a long time now back way back in my 30s when I was trying to finish my first novel Torch and I felt like I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't be successful. I realized that I was going to have to change my definition of success. And to me, it, it's this. Can I answer yes to these two questions? Did I did I do what I said I would do? Did I make good on my intentions? And did I do it to the very, very best of my abilities? Did I hold myself to a rigorous standard? If I can say yes and yes, I succeeded. And that's important because of course, when you're in the arts, I think this translates to every profession, but certainly when you're writing a book, if the measure of success was going to be that it's published or that it's a bestseller, or that it wins a national book award or it gets adapted into a TV show, um, you, you can't base success on that, right? Because that's all so much outside of my power. What's in my power is me doing my work and doing it well. And so that to me is the, the, the my measure of success for sure. Now, when it comes to my career, what's happened is it's expanded in beautiful and surprising ways because I have held true to what I just said. I held true to doing the work, doing the work, the best of my abilities to the best of my abilities over and over and over and over again. And then every time, oh, you know, because of that, an opportunity came up, I said, yes. And I followed the path down, you know, down all of these wild directions that took me here to you. I mean, if you think that I had any inkling that this dear sugar column that I said yes to, that I was paid nothing for, and that I wrote anonymously, would end up being a book, let alone a TV show, I would have said you're fooling me because it can't be true. And yet here we are. Yeah, and it's such a good reminder of the long game too, especially thinking about this show where we see young Claire who you know wants to be a writer right then and there, but then think about your, you know the trajectory of your career and how long these things actually take. But like you said, it's so simple, the two questions you have to answer. Yeah, that's, you know, and that's one of the sweetest, um, parts of the show to me, those, those young moments where young Claire is finding her way into her writing. And then when we see adult Claire stepping back into her writing, that, that I find that very moving because it is really important to learn how to, to keep faith with yourself and believe in yourself because no one else is going to believe in you um, quite the way you believe in yourself when you're writing. And, and I love that that's reenacted, that that's captured very much in the show. Well, thank you so much for talking me talking to me today, Cheryl. Tiny Beautiful Things is streaming on Hulu on April 7th. Yay!